Praise the Lord and happy Sabbath City Temple. Once again, it's good to be with you. Even though we're still meeting virtually, I thank God that we have this opportunity to still connect in various ways other than face to face. But God is going to bless us this week with a wonderful word. And I trust and believe that you've already been blessed by the music, by the prayers, by the uh, comments that have been made by my wonderful and illustrious team that I have here at City Temple. And I just want to give a big just shout out to everybody who has been going the extra mile and making sure that our services are clear, that our services are communicated, and that we are doing our best to serve you in the midst of this pandemonium and this coronavirus crisis. And so we ask you to continue to pray for us, pray for our country, pray for our world, and pray for those that are being uh, victimized by injustice and intolerance. And so with that being said, uh, I was blessed this week when I was doing my devotion and I came across this passage and I felt like the Lord was telling me that I need to preach this. And so for this week, uh, on this day, I want to preach from the, uh, from the book of Genesis chapter 34, verses 27 to 31. Genesis chapter 34, verses 27 to 31. And this is what the Bible says. Meanwhile, the rest of Jacob's sons arrived, finding the men slaughtered. They plundered the town because their sister had been defiled there. They seized all the flocks and herds and donkeys, everything they could lay their hands on, both inside the town and outside in the fields. They looted all their wealth and plundered their houses. They also took all their little children and wives and led them away as captives. Afterward, Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have ruined me. You have made me stink among all the people of this land, among all the Canaanites and Perizzites. We are so few that they will join forces and crush us. I will be ruined and my entire household will be wiped out. But why should we let him treat our sister like a prostitute? They retorted angrily. All of you are Bible scholars and you know that I'm reading about the, the rape and the violence committed towards Dina. And so with our prayers today, I'm asking you to be with me as I preach on the topic. No way she ain't going out like that. Let's pray. Father, which art in heaven, we thank you so much that you've been a mighty good God. Your grace and mercy flows like mighty streams of water. And we pray that you be with me right now that as I speak, that you would allow your words to come clearly, that I may do uh, justice to the text and most of all to you and to only speak your words, not mine. And this I pray in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. In a male-dominated society, women always get overlooked, overshadowed, and overpowered. And there are countless stories of the many ways women are treated differently from men simply because of their gender. From day to day, sisters have to wake up and climb a mountain of criticism and ridicule from their counterparts. In the opening chapter of Mary McLeod's book, profound work, Living Well Despite Catching Hell, she says that it is still open season for women, that despite of all the academic achievements and financial accumulation, sisters still get the short end of the stick. Why, you ask? It is because America suffers from a value gap. And I'm always in a book, and Eddie Glaude in his the book Democracy and Blackness discusses so eloquently that in America there is a value gap. And a value gap that certain people are valued more than others. And that's why you can work at a job, train someone, and watch them get the job promotion before you do because of a value gap. They value one more than the other. That's why you got to fight with those men at the mechanic shop because they think they always got to charge you more. A value gap. They value men more than they value, value women. And that's why it's been proven that yeah, women are offered higher interest rates, women are charged more for vehicles, women are more likely to be subjected to traffic, sex, sex trafficking, and retired women are more likely to live in poverty. Women are more likely to die from uh, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, and in some cases deal with misdiagnosis. There is a value gap when it comes to our sisters in this country. Yet given all the stress, that black women face, it is amazing that they still have the lowest rate of suicide compared to any other demographic in the American society. And this is a remarkable statement to the resiliency, strength, fortitude, focus, faith, and psychological constitution 
of the black woman. And so what happens? They press on. They not only survive, but they thrive in the midst of societal stress on their physical health and emotional pain of social rejection and a pain that hardly gets acknowledged or even validated. I'm preaching to somebody in right here. And isn't it a crying shame that it has been approximately four months since the death of Breonna Taylor, yet still there are no arrests or charges for the officers that have been involved in her death. But she's not the only woman that has been tossed to the side. How about a Tatiana Jefferson, Sandra Bland, Rakia Boyd, or just to name a few. These have been cases of violence, the rise in violence also against the black transgender community as well. That's just in, that's just not in this world, but the slow violence that happens outside of the church, there is a slow violence that happens to our women inside of the church as well. And so our text this afternoon is about Jacob's daughter. You got to read the whole chapter if you have not read it before. And this story gets inserted into the story of Jacob and Jacob's sons. And it, it is an amazing story. And the Bible writer puts this story in here for a reason. And that is for us to pay careful attention to it. It is the rape of Dina. It is about power, subjugation, and intimidation. The chapter informs us that there's a brother by the name of Shechem. Shechem uh, it has no self-control. Shechem is the son of the king and the city of Shechem is named after him. So Shechem is feeling himself. And when he saw Dina, the text says that he saw her, took her, laid with her and defiled her. That's a problem when you give some men power that they feel like they can exercise it in any way that they want to and lord themselves over a woman in order that he has the audacity to see her, take her, lay with her and defile her as if she is some sort of plunder for him to conquer, that he catches uh, Dina and defiles her. It turns out Shechem must have thought she was church's chicken because all he wanted was her breasts, legs, and thighs. Shechem didn't want nothing to do with her but to use her and to abuse her. And unfortunately, check this out, weak men will always feel like they have to have the need to take advantage of a woman. I'm going to say that one more time. Weak men always feel like they got to take advantage of a woman. And isn't it the sad reality in this male dominated world that we live in women have always paid the price because of men's foolish decisions because of men's brash decisions women are always paying the price for the mess that we create and yet still they are subjugated to come up after us and clean up our mess every time we make it women pay more for houses pay more for cars pay more in time and strength at the hand of selfless brothers and that's why I'm preaching this text and as I'm preaching this text my boy I'm thinking about my boy the poetic preacher of the pavement yes I'm talking about Tupac Shakur Tupac when he said and since we all came from a woman got our name from a woman and our gain from a woman I wonder why we take from our women why we rape our women do we hate our women and I can't quote Tupac unless I also go and quote Rhapsody the the femme C who is killing it in the game right now who takes Tupac's words and writes in the song called a Fenny Shakur and check what my girl Rhapsody says. Rhapsody says, I pray for you. I pray you feel the same way as the Tupac song. We ain't your H's, your B's, your trophies are meant for Pippin. Recognize a gift from God outweighs a birthday or a Christmas. To protect our lives, you gonna take it to the limit. Rib of our rib, do you still feel us in you? Let me say that one more time. She closes out by saying, rib of our rib, do you still feel us in you. Here is Rhapsody, perplexed, confused, and trying to figure out, like Marvin Gaye, what's going on? Brothers, we came from you. God created us from you. Do you still feel us inside of you? Then when did the subjugation and the, the, the misogyny occur? When did you start tossing us to the side? Rhapsody is trying to figure out, when did we become enemies instead of you protecting us? Why are you throwing us underneath the bus? And here's the 
reality because in a real sense this is the truth about the image of black women in our society women black women have also always been portrayed as less than human they are some sort of amalgamation of man <clears throat> of man and beast they have always been subjugated as less than human not only have they been subjugated as less than human, the objectification of black women predates slavery. That even back then, when you portray women as less than human and objects of only pleasure, that only makes sense that in a society, it would treat them any less than what they are supposed to be. If you look at them as less than human and objectify them as sexual objects for male pleasure, pleasure and dominance, then you're going to treat them like they are nothing. Why would we expect anything less? Because black women have historically and continually experienced some of the highest rates of violence, including lethal, physical, and sexual violence. Some of the highest rates of maternal mortality and stress-related medical conditions, and some of the highest rates of poverty and unemployment of any group in the United States of America. That's why I'm Malcolm X says the most hated individual in our country, the most disrespected individual in our country is the African-American woman because black women also have the highest rates of police stops, police violence, arrest, incarceration, and carceral control among women and represent the fastest growing prison and jail population in this country. Yo, our sisters are catching it from every angle. Our sisters are catching it left and right. They can't even catch a break because not only as a society that we expect our sisters to be superwoman, they have had to live up to a superwoman facade as well. And I'm going to say this right now, superwoman is killing our sisters. The fact that it is breaking them down, the fact that they got to do everything, finance our dreams, finance the church, finance society and say and to say thanks to them we throw them underneath the bus well the text tells us that after Shechem had his way with Dina, then in a sick and twisted, demented mind state, Shechem goes to his daddy, privilege. He goes to his father, father, daddy, Hamer, and tells his daddy that to give me that girl, I want to marry her. And in a strange, twisted circumstances of events, do you hear what I'm saying right now? That the Bible says that he wants to marry her after he done used and abused her? You want to marry her so that you can abuse her some more? You want to marry her so that she, you can defile her whenever you want? You want to marry her so that she could be your maid? Because you do know that sexual violence and rape does not only occur outside of the context of marriage, but there is also uh, there is also evidence of it happening within the context of marriage. And here Shechem, with all his privilege, says, I want to marry her and make her her out to be my wife and to be my maid and do whatever I want her to do. And I want to preach to my sisters out there. Sisters, you got to watch out for brothers that want to marry you for the wrong reasons. You got to know whether you got love or a leech. Let me say that one more time. Do you have love or do you have a leech? Because love gives and leeches suck from you. They suck the life out of you. That's what a leech does. It attaches to you and it sucks everything out outside of you. A leech will take from you until you ain't got nothing left. A leech will leave you emotionally bankrupt. That It will continue to withdraw from you instead of making deposits in you. Are you dating some? Are you in love or are you in a leech relationship? Because you got to understand that when you end up dating a leech, you end up becoming like a hotel key card. What are you saying, Pastor Jay? What I'm saying is this is that if you put a hotel key card next to a cell phone, 
the magnets in the cell phone will suck all the energy out of the key card so that when you are trying to get inside of your room the key card becomes useless are you dating a magnet is that magnet pulling stuff out of you pulling everything out of you got you stressed out got you messed up got you on your knees at night crying wondering what is going on you got a leech and you need to get rid of that leech right now or do something about that and so here it is because you got to realize it is better to be alone for the right reasons than to be with somebody for the wrong reasons. I'm going to say that one more time. You could tweet red right now. Put that on your Instagram. It is better to be alone for the right reasons than to be with someone for the wrong reasons. And so in our text, we discover that Shechem wants to be with her for the wrong reasons. And then in verse five, the text says, when Jacob heard that Dina had been defiled, his sons were in the field with his livestock. And so he did nothing about it until they came home. Mm. Daddy Jacob, Hamer informed Jacob what his son did to Dina. And the word says, and this ain't me, the Bible says that he did nothing. I mean, can you imagine what's going through Dina's mind right now? Can you imagine knowing that you have been raped and then your daddy does nothing? Dina must think that she is damaged goods. I mean, y'all got to get this thing. Remember, Dina is the daughter of Leah. She is Jacob's only daughter. We know that Jacob had no respect for Leah. Therefore, he probably didn't have no respect for Dina. We know that Jacob did not love Leah as much as he loved Rachel. I guess you could say it was an entanglement. Entanglement that Jacob worked for Leah. Jacob worked for Rachel, his Uncle Laban gave him Leah. Jacob did not like Leah. Worked seven more years for Rachel. Rachel kept on boring son after son after son. And every time she had a son for the brother, she would name the son and say, hopefully my husband will show affection towards me. I mean, loving Jacob was killing Leah. And Leah has him, abhors him a daughter after she gave him after son after son. And so you can imagine that Leah is not respected. Leah's kids are not respected. Jacob is a hot mess because Jacob, the Bible says, when he finds out his only baby girl has been raped, he does nothing. And it's a terrible thing. Check this out. That when a father does not love his daughter enough to do something to avenge her when somebody victimizes her. It is a terrible thing when a father is not willing to defend his daughter. It is an awful thing when a father ignores and dismisses his daughter's pain because if he rejects her, check this out, if he rejects and ignores her, she will spend her life trying to replace him in her heart. And if he is warm and nurturing, she will look for a lover who is equal to him. But if he thinks she is beautiful, worthy, and feminine, she will be inclined to see herself in that way. Fathers, we got work to do with our daughters because when we reject our daughters, then they go, then they go about looking for somebody who can replace the love that we should have given them in the first place. And then oftentimes they cling to what is poisonous. They cling to what is detrimental to them. They become what is known as damaged goods. And you do know what damaged goods are. Damaged goods is when you walk inside a Best Buy or you walk inside of an electronics uh, store, you would see a table. And on that table, they would have damaged goods or open boxes. And what do they do? They auction it off to the person who pays a less a, a, a cheaper price than what it was originally valued for. And so that's what happens with our sisters when they come with home hurt, when they come with pain from their families, when they come from pain from being rejected and abandoned by their daddies. They are subjected, subjugated to damaged goods and the lowest bidder comes and picks them up and treats them less than what they are worth. And so Dina must think, she must be damaged goods. I mean, at the end of the day, if this brother Shechem can do what he wants 
and he can have his way with me. My father does nothing. And in a strange turn of events, check this out, that because the father wants to make peace with them, he barters off his daughter and makes an agreement with the men of of the of the men of Shechem in order for them to be circumcised and he can have his daughter. And so here it is, Simeon and Levi are in the room as this is happening and Simeon and Levi are thinking about doing something other than what their father is thinking about because Jacob didn't do nothing. Simeon and Levi took matters into their own hands and Hamar, Hamar as he negotiated with Jacob Jacob and negotiated with the sons, they agreed that all men be circumcised so that Shechem could marry Dina. The story, the story is twisting. The story's got a lot of turns. There's a plot twist. The text says that they spoke deceitfully, but three days later, when their wounds were still sore, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, who were what Dina's full brothers, took their swords entered the town without opposition, and then they slaughtered every male there, including Hamer and his son Shechem. They killed them with their swords, then took Dina from Shechem's house and returned her to the camp park right there. We had thought, imagined that Dina had been set free after Shechem had did what he did with her in between the sheets, but only to discover she was being held captive by Shechem and his pounds. God only knows what else Shechem was doing to her at the time. But the Bible says that the brothers Simeon and Levi decided that they were going to do a plot twist and go back and kill the whole family and avenge their sister's blood. And so as a matter of fact, the brothers were like, nah, she ain't going out like that. We ain't going to let our sister be treated in such a way that is less than what she is valued. Since daddy didn't want to do nothing, the brothers decided to step up. And the moment, check this out, the moment that this happens and after they had wiped out all their livestock, plundered their land, my prophetic imagination leads me to think that if daddy Jacob, check this out, had just did something, if anything he had did, perhaps this bloodshed could have never been occurred. Perhaps this could have been prevented if he had defended his daughter's honor. And in the moment that Jacob heard what the sons had done, the text says that he gets angry. Now, now Jacob is showing emotion. He begins to get enraged. He is fuming. He is fed up with the two boys. He says, you have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. The Bible, the, the message Bible translate the same verse like this. If Jacob says to them, you have ruined me. What is wrong with you boys? You have ruined my reputation. Now, all of a sudden, Jacob knows how to be enraged. Jacob knows about his reputation and Jacob is worried about what them fools gonna be saying about him in these streets. Jacob is concerned about what other nations will be saying about him. He's worried about his integrity and inability to keep a promise amongst the fraternity of the brothers or the men that are living in that land. I mean, can you imagine Jacob's only daughter has been defiled and Jacob finds a way to make this about him and not about his daughter? Jacob is only concerned about himself. His brothers respond by saying, but why should we let him treat our sister like a prostitute? And that's a powerful text right there because they retorted angrily at their father and looking at him and saying, hold up, hold up. How are you going to be mad and concerned about your reputation, but you ain't concerned about your daughter's reputation? How are you going to be mad at us? For, for doing what we thought we thought was right by defending our sister's honor and you only care about yourself. They retorted angrily back to their father. In other words, in the King Jamie remix, they were just like, daddy, you bugging out, you tripping. She ain't going out like that. And so that's the word right there. And what I want to highlight here is that here are the brothers and they are standing up for our sister. And so this is it right here. As men, we need to stand up and say, 
Our sisters ain't going out like that. We need to be just as enraged and angry as Dina's brother and not allow our sisters to be prostituted. This is not the time for us as men to just sit and stay quiet on the sidelines, but we got to stand up and speak up for our sisters. I don't know if you've ever watched a sporting event. It's been a while since we've had sports, but everybody knows that in the game, there is what's called the sidelines. And on the sidelines, you have individuals who are sitting there. Either they have been benched or they are too injured to play along with the rest of the team at the moment. But here's the beautiful thing about the people on the sideline is that when they're on the sideline, they don't sit there and act disinterested in what's going on. They don't sit there and start looking all over the place. They are sitting there cheering and rooting and pushing up and, and cheering and rooting and helping their team to win the game because why they realize that we are a team and we are all on the same field and it's time us brothers as we are on the sidelines to cheer for our sisters to lift up our sisters to give them the push that they need so that they may be able to do the things that they need to do if we gonna win this game if we gonna move forward then we got to work towards equality and equity and as men, we got to pave the way so that they can lead the way. We cannot let our sisters be pimped by the system that refrain, that refrains them from advancing, a system that refrains them from climbing to the top of becoming a head or the president of an organization. We got to be, or we can't be okay with that. We can't be okay with them being refrained, but okay with them coming into ministry through the back door. We ain't gonna ordain you, but we're gonna commission you through the back door. We cannot be okay with the murders of Breonna Taylor, Sandra Bland, Rakia Boy, who are, uh, that they are still walking around freely. We cannot go another day without saying their names, call their names out. All the women who have been victimized by a society that does not acknowledge their humanity. We can no longer go without acknowledging the Dinas in our church, in our pews, and in our community. They're their stories need to be heard without judgment, ridicule, and shame. And amazingly, in the midst of all of this, this is where the text speaks the loudest. Nobody knows what Dina actually wants. Her father ignores her and her brothers avenge her through murder. And the only thing we know about Dina is that she is raped, held captive by Shechem, and then her brothers rescue her. Dina has no voice. And oftentimes when the story is read, we tend to focus only on Jacob, Shechem, but what about Dina? We are only left to assume that Dina faced the same pattern that most women have been, that most women have faced who have been victims of violence because whenever a woman speaks up about her violence, unfortunately, she is never believed. And she is always looked at as a liar, as this can't happen to you. Because as I stated before, when you, when you uh, subject women to only be a peer as if they are not human, and if that's they are objects of sexual pleasure, that when they are raped, they are lying about it or they either deserve it. And so Dina is silenced throughout this entire story. Her brother is, uh, her brothers are highlighted in this story. Jacob is highlighted in this story. But what about Dina? What does this text say about the Dinas that are all around us? What does this text say about the Dinas that live in our community? What does this text say about the Dinas that we go to school and that we work with all the time who suffer in silence and live in shame because of fear of confronting their predator or speaking out against their victimization? Dina, we are so sorry as a male, as a man. I am sorry if I I have ever been a part of a patriarchal system that has muzzled the dinas that are all around us. I am sorry if I've ever embodied the spirit of a Jacob or a Shechem or a Simeon that have decided how I want to avenge or speak on your behalf and letting you share your story. And so the pattern for Dina is the pattern that we see in our yet to be United States of America, that the dinas are often 
and suffered and segregated and often subjected to silence and violence as others do and go on their merry way because the most disrespected person in America is the black woman. The most unprotected person in America is the black woman. The most neglected person in America is the black woman. And so how, is, how can we as brothers reverse this sick narrative that we have? Number one, to all my brothers that are listening out there, start affirming our sisters, start affirming our wives, our sisters, our aunties, our uncles. Tell them how much you appreciate them. Tell them how much you love them because not affirming them because you and don't affirm them because you want something from them. Don't affirm them because you trying to get something from them. Affirm them just to affirm them because they need the affirmation. Affirm them because they deserve it. Black women are some of the hardest working people in this country. It is the African American woman. She not only carries the burden of her children, but she has the weight of the world of her family and her career on her shoulders. Let that sister know that she doing the doggone thing, that you appreciate her. Give her a break from every now and then. I don't mean to brag y'all, but let me tell y'all something. I run my house. I run the house that I live in. What do I do? I run the washing machine. I run the dishwasher. I run the vacuum. The only thing I don't run is my mouth. I just try to stay silent and do what I need to do because I appreciate my queen, my queen Carlene that Amen. I live with. She is the one who holds me up. That's my pastor right there. Affirm that sister. Let her know that she's doing the doggone thing. Number two, brothers, let me say this right now. Get out the way. Guess the step and steps to the side. Why do I say that? Because in our male dominated society, we have brought nothing but havoc and calamity, not only to our sisters, but to each other. Black male privilege, and listen to me, black male privilege needs to create the platforms for our sisters to speak and lead the movement in this moment of black lives, in this moment of racial injustice, in this moment moment of, of violence towards a particular part of humanity. Sisters need to be leading the charge. Sisters need to be in the forefront. We need to get out the way and let them do the doggone thing. What does that mean by how do we get out the way? We get out the way when we start funding their dreams and amplifying their voices. Amplify it. That means that to make their voices louder. We don't got to speak for them no more. They got brains. God gave it to them. They are leaders. They know how to speak. But I think it's time that men stop leading this movement and we need to start letting our sisters create the create the society that we want to see because they got all the answers right now. And number three that I got to say this is we got to listen, listen, listen. It is so important that we listen to the deaners amongst us, that we listen to the women that are amongst us. You can't do nothing if you're not willing to listen to their stories. We didn't listen to Dina in the Bible. Are we going to follow the same pattern? We need to stop and listen because you do know that the word listen has the same letters as the word silent. You can't have listen and without being silent. You got to be silent and hear what they have to say because when we don't listen, when we don't, when we ignore our sisters, we are saying we are ignoring your story. We are ignoring your plight and you do not deserve to be heard. We got to listen without the intent to reply, but listen with the intent to understand where they are coming from because we have to let our sisters know that their voices matter. Their emotions emotions matter, their pain matters, that their lives matter as well. Don't let them get drowned out in the midst of the Black Lives Matter movement. Don't let them get drowned out. Let's not forget it is unfortunate of what happened to George Floyd. It is unfortunate of what happened to Ahmaud Arbery, but there's a Breonna Taylor in there as well. There is a Sandra Bland that came before that. There is a Rakia Boyd that is in there as well. There are so many other women who have gotten lost in the movement because 
all we do is focus on the men. Sisters, it is time that we take the role that you have taken and support you and finance your dreams. And we have to listen to their stories because the day we stop listening is the beginning of us saying that you don't matter. And I want every sister out there to know that it is important that they matter. If we want to see this world change, we got to let the sisters do their thing. And so I want to speak to any Dina that is out there, to any Dina who has been subjugated to silence, to any Dina who has been muzzled by male patriarchy and dominance and policies that continue to push you to the side, to all the brothers who have who have supported the idea and called them in our society welfare queens and loud video vixens and gold diggers and have planted on them stereotypes and labels that they don't even deserve. We got to change that narrative, brothers. But I want to talk to Dina right now. If there is a Dina listening to me right now, if there is a Dina who is watching this sermon, that your story is not over. As a matter of fact, my favorite preacher, tells a story about the time he visited South Africa. And while he was in South Africa, he had visited a young lady's house. And as he was inside of the young lady's house, he had noticed a beautiful painting on her wall. I mean, the painting took up the whole wall. It was wonderful. It was something he had never seen. Intrigued by the painting, he asked the sister, who did this for you? She goes in to tell him the history of the painting. She says that one night she had a party and some friends were joking and laughing and one of the friends spilled some grape juice on the wall of the on on her beautiful white wall and as they were partying the grape juice got on the wall. She says that she had tried everything. She had tried scrubbing it. She had tried painting over it. She even tried to put something over the picture and try to erase it, but it would always creep out. There was in, it was in an angle that it could not be taken away. And so she says that one day her father came to visit. And as her father looked at the painting and I mean, excuse me, as her father looked at the wall and he saw the grape juice on it, he had realized how distraught and how this blemish was messing up her daughter's, his daughter's life. And so what does he do? He tells the daughter to leave for a few days and I'm going to take care of it. Unbeknownst to the daughter, the father knew a famous painter, a well-known painter, and the painter came in and painted a beautiful picture on the wall where the grape juice was. When she came back home, she saw this beautiful mural that was painted on her wall and she was thanking her father, thanking her father for what he had did. But check this out. What the painter did was he painted a picture over the blemish and so that you would have never known that there was a blemish there. The pastor was saying, I would have, I did not even realize that this blemish was there. She said, yes, the painter painted over the blemish so that you can't see it no more. And then this is what tripped him out was that after she said that not only did he paint over the blemish, but because he put this painting on the wall and he signed his name at the bottom of it, the house is worth double than what I paid for. It, it increased its value. And that's my word to some sister that is listening out there. Yes, you may have a blemish. Yes, you may have a stain on you. Yes, you may have a spot on you, but you got a father who knows somebody who can come inside and paint over the blemishes in your life. And when he puts his name, son of uh, son, son of God, savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Lord, leader and liberator on the, on your heart, he inscripts his name on your heart. You are worth more than any price than any human being can put upon you. And so that's my word to somebody out here today that don't allow the, the male dominated society silence you by this painful predicament that we read about in Dina, but that we can change the narrative. But that only works when we work together and we allow our Dinas to share their stories and to speak it the way they know how to. Because oftentimes in the church, we get uncomfortable when we have to hear stories like this. And so we try to filter it to protect and preserve, not the victim, but to protect ourselves. And so the reality is that 
one in five women have been abused, whether physically or emotionally. And so if I were in church right now and I were just to go one, two, three, four, abused, one, two, three, four, abused, one, two, three, four, abused, even in the midst of this pandemic with coronavirus and how we have to shelter in place, let us not forget for the children, for the daughters, for even the sons too that have to live with their predators because you do know that school was a safe space where children can get away from that. And so let's pray for them as well. Let's pray for the victims of human trafficking. Let's pray for those who are afraid to share their story. And so my appeal to any Dina that is out there, to whoever you are, that if you have a story to share or something you want to say, then I pray that you would reach out to the number that is on the bottom of this screen and that you would share your story and that we would find a way to support you and help you as you navigate through this life. You should never have to live with that kind of shame and pain because it can alter every decision that you make later on in your life. And so we got to do a better job, brothers. Not saying that we are, all of us are doing a terrible job, but we got to find a way to let our sisters lead the moment and the movement to create the society that we want to see for our children. And so I'm inviting you to bow your heads and to pray with me. Dear God Almighty, you are no stranger to pain and victimization. You are no stranger to what has happened to your children for you have seen everything. And the Bible says that you catch all our tears and put them in little bottles. And so, Lord, I pray for the tears of the Dinas that are listening today. I pray for those that have been hurt. I pray for those that have gone through whatever stress that they did not deserve or bring upon themselves. And Father, we pray for peace. But we also pray that we can be able to have the courage to not only listen to their stories, but to do something for them and that they would have the courage to speak up and speak out and so God I pray for every victim of rape I pray for every victim of abuse I pray Lord for every victim of intolerance and injustice that God that whatever stains or blemishes upon them that you would wipe all of them away and so Lord we know you are a good God and only you can do it we don't know why these things happen we don't understand it but we do understand that you are loving, you are forgiving, and that you are a good father. Unlike Jacob and his example that he displayed in chapter 34. You are a good, loving father. And so, Lord, love on your children. Bless them, Lord, and keep them. We ask this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please don't turn off the uh, devices or your computer. Here is a song that was created by one of our very own. And I'm not going to say her name. I'm going to let you watch her video. But she directed, she wrote the song, and she put it together. And I hope that you enjoy it. And God bless you, and have a wonderful Sabbath.